Oh, this poor clown has more to worry about than a bad performance. Let's meet our clinical case. Chuckles the clown is presenting to clinic where he reports that he's been having difficulty swallowing. Initially, this was just to solids, but he's now having trouble even swallowing liquids. He also reports that his GERD has been acting up more lately, causing retrosternal discomfort. However, he's noted that the pain only happens when swallowing, which is different from his GERD symptoms. Chuckles also reports a 50-pack year smoking history. Making people laugh is stressful business. Luckily, he was able to quit five years ago. Chuckles finishes up the visit, stating that he's had progressive weight loss. Initially, he thought it was just stress, but now he's concerned that there's something else going on. What should we do for Chuckles? The question wants to know what the best step in management is. Hmm, dysphagia. The differential is very broad, but we definitely have some clues pointing to the next best step. Well, you may remember from our sketch on GERD at the Hurdy Gurdy Family Fun Center that the first step in a patient with alarm symptoms is EGD. While historically, barium swallow x-ray was an important first step in the evaluation of dysphagia, this is not the case anymore. Starting with barium swallow is now debated and shouldn't even be considered first line in patients with alarm findings, such as significant weight loss, progressive dysphagia to solids and liquids, or strong clinical risk factors all of which are present in this clown. The truly understated linchpin holding this entire vaudeville show together. This is all sounding very familiar. If you haven't had a chance to check out our sketch on the workup of GERD, we recommend that you do that. We covered these alarm symptoms and other indications for EGD in that sketch. Done with our clinical case already? Of course we aren't. Even though EGD was the correct next step in workup, here's our sketchy curveball. Second part of the question. If the biopsy demonstrates adenocarcinoma, what are the complications of surgical resection? In patients like this, the first step should be endoscopic evaluation with EGD. Esophageal disorders can take many forms on endoscopic evaluation, ranging from superficial plaques, ulcers, or strictures all the way to large mass lesions, like carcinoma, all the way to, well, nothing. In any case, endoscopic biopsy of any diseased area, if present, is performed for tissue evaluation. Given his constellation of symptoms, let's say this patient goes straight to the GI suite for endoscopy. Let's also say that the endoscopist sees some ulceration in the distal esophagus, which may or may not be related to long-standing GERD. Let's also also say he takes a biopsy. Any guesses on what news the pathologist might have for this, uh, hardest working man in show business? A good and correct guess would be esophageal cancer, especially adenocarcinoma, given his GERD and smoking history, but more on that later. The most important symptoms of esophageal cancer include dysphagia, which progresses from solids initially to both solids and liquids later, and significant weight loss. Retrosternal chest pain or symptoms of GERD may also be present, though this isn't always the case. Other symptoms may also develop depending on local spread and invasion of surrounding structures. These include hoarseness due to compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, or even hemoptysis, or coughing up blood, if the tracheobronchial tree is invaded. So we've sketched it all in here, with the rookie cowboy getting socked in the chest by what appears to be a live, undomesticated horse on stage. That's just a terrible idea. Notice the oddly squamous tile pattern to the stage front and the cute little two-thirds sweater on the pupper here? It's to help remind you that squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus is possible as well. In fact, cancer in the upper two-thirds of the esophagus is usually squamous cell carcinoma and is actually the most common cause of esophageal cancer worldwide. Risk factors for squamous cell esophageal cancer include smoking, alcohol, diets high in nitrosamines, i.e. cured meats, drinking absurdly hot beverages, and, of course, beetle nuts. Esophageal metastases travel quickly through submucosal lymphatic channels and squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus tend to metastasize to the lungs, as the upper and middle thirds of the esophagus drains into the cervical nodes and mediastinal nodes, respectively. Now let's contrast squamous cell carcinoma with another carcinoma of the esophagus, one which we've already mentioned. Cancer in the lower one-third of the esophagus is more likely to be adenocarcinoma, and can be seen here with this filthy goop on the bottom of this curtain. While squamous cell carcinoma is the most common esophageal cancer worldwide, adenocarcinoma is the most common form of esophageal cancer in the United States. Risk factors for esophageal adenocarcinoma include Barrett's esophagus, 
which is intestinal metaplasia of the distal esophagus from longstanding GERD. In fact, Barrett's esophagus carries a 40-fold increased risk for developing esophageal cancer. Other risk factors for esophageal adenocarcinoma include smoking and obesity, especially when combined with pre-existing Barrett's esophagus. So, uh, seriously? Don't smoke. Especially if you're plump enough to be a good meal for a bear. Remember back to our clinical case? Chuckles the Clown had these, smoking and GERD. It didn't mention whether he was obese, but he had enough weight wiggle room to lose 75 pounds. Likely, his weight was contributing to his GERD as well. Liver or peritoneal metastases are more common with adenocarcinoma of the lower one-third of the esophagus due to caudal lymphatic drainage to the gastric and celiac lymph nodes. Any hooser. With our clinical patient's tissue diagnosis in hand, remember we said it was adenocarcinoma, the next step in the workup of esophageal cancer is to determine the stage, which is dependent on tumor invasion, lymph node involvement, and, of course, metastasis. Whoa, look out, everyone. That CT cat looks a bit feistier and bigger than our usual symbol. This is because a critical step in workup is to determine lymph node spread or distant metastasis with esophageal cancer, and other cancers for that matter, and so CT scans are performed. Not just any CTs, though. In addition to normal CT, positron emission tomography, aka PET scanning, is performed using radio-labeled glucose to better evaluate for potential metastases. PET images are combined with CT images and are commonly referred to as a PET CT scan, hence the radioactive jungle cat. Let's get Chuckles the Clown from our clinical case on over to radiology for some scanning. So let's say there aren't any metastases on our clinical patient's PET CT which, if they were present, would automatically make his cancer inoperable. The next step would be to determine the extent of primary tumor invasion using endoscopic ultrasound, which gives a much clearer picture than CT or MRI. To remember endoscopic and ultrasound, we've sketched in a pretty obviously mouth-shaped bullhorn here. Just a totally normal stage prop, you know. The importance is how deep into the layers of the wall of the esophagus that the cancer infiltrates not the size. Endoscopic ultrasound is also useful for looking at lymph nodes around the esophagus. With the degree of invasion, making up the T in TNM, and nodal spread and metastasis, the N and M in TNM, determined by PET-CT, the cancer can then be staged by the good old TNM system. While we won't get into the nitty-gritty of the TNM staging system, just remember that any metastasis outside the area of resection that would be removed with esophagectomy is an automatic contraindication to surgery. This is also the case if the primary tumor has invaded into structures such as the trachea, vertebra, or lung if there's a malignant pleural effusion or ascites. So this scalpel-wielding lion tamer here is scared away by the mini crab metastases raining down off the stage. Treatment varies depending on the stage of cancer, the location of the cancer, and, to some degree, the surgeon preference. Current treatment protocols call for single therapy, i.e. straight to surgery, or some combination of chemo-radiotherapy and possible resection. 5-fluorouracil and cisplatin are the staples of chemo, and in some cases, chemoradiation can shrink tumors enough to make them resectable. Neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy is indicated for any tumors with a designation of T2, N0, M0, or higher. So you can see our amateur chemist here on the Tier 2 balcony overseeing things. Just don't ask why he's practicing chemistry on the balcony of a vaudeville show. If the cancer is T2, N0, M0, or lower, patients may go straight to esophagectomy as the first-line treatment. Notice that the T2 is sort of on the fence there. That's because whether or not to perform neoadjuvant therapy first or esophagectomy first is debated, but can go either way with T2N0M0 disease. Cancers of the cervical and upper esophagus are very difficult to treat surgically and are most commonly treated with chemoradiation alone. If patients fail medical therapy, the operation involves removal of portions of the pharynx, larynx, thyroid, and proximal esophagus and placement of a permanent tracheostomy. Ouch. The three most common procedures for removing esophageal cancer are the transhiatal esophagectomy, Ivor Lewis esophagectomy, and triincisional esophagectomy. The transhiatal esophagectomy, which our patient is a perfect candidate for, starts with the laparotomy and cervical neck incision. The entire esophagus, from the pharynx to the GE junction, can be removed. After removal of the esophagus, the stomach is fashioned into a conduit, pulled up through the chest and attached to the pharynx to restore continuity. 
Two major advantages of the transhiatal esophagectomy are that the entire esophagus can be removed, and the final anastomosis is in the neck, not the chest. More on that soon. Another approach is the Ivor Lewis esophagectomy, which involves both laparotomy and thoracotomy to remove the esophageal segment. An anastomosis is again created using the stomach as a conduit, but this time the anastomosis lies in the chest, not the neck. This is a major disadvantage, as anastomotic leaks into the chest can be catastrophic. Furthermore, only the distal one-third of the esophagus can be effectively removed. An advantage, however, is that the thoracic lymph nodes can be removed much more completely, which can be important in patients with involvement of these nodes. Last but not least, the triincisional esophagectomy, which takes a little bit from both of the previous procedures. The tri in triincisional is for the cervical incision, thoracotomy, and laparotomy incisions required. The laparotomy and cervical incision allow for both removal of all the esophagus and cervical anastomosis, while the thoracotomy allows for extensive thoracic lymph node dissection. Whatever the approach used, postoperative chemo with cisplatin and 5-fluorouracil is indicated for node positive disease discovered after surgery. One of the most common and feared complications of esophagectomy is anastomotic leak, which can occur in up to 40% of patients. Cervical anastomotic leaks can typically be managed with local wound drainage, which is why our uh, volunteer appears to be pretty happy, even though she's got a little something coming from her neck. On the other hand, anastomotic leaks in the thoracic cavity are much more severe and can lead to soilage of the thorax and mediastinum, which can sometimes require re-exploration for repair and drainage, which is not a small task in someone recently post-op from an esophagectomy. The most severe version of a leak from a thoracic esophageal anastomosis is called mediastinitis, which can lead to sepsis and death. So we've sketched in our flame-laced frilly shirt over the, what I'm gonna call, too worried-looking magician here. Aha! Here's the answer to our second clinical question. I wonder if there are other complications as well. With all the admittedly violent manipulation of the esophagus within the mediastinum during esophagectomy, it's no surprise that there is some collateral damage along the way. A delicate structure that sits right around the esophagus in the chest is the thoracic duct, and damage to it can lead to accumulation of chyle in the pleural space, aka chylothorax. Chylothorax is relatively common post-esophagectomy, occurring in up to 10% of patients. Since it's a pleural filling disorder, you'll see some of the common themes from other disorders like pleural effusion or hemothorax like distant breath sounds, dullness to percussion, and opacification on chest x-ray, especially opacification of the hemidiaphragm and blunting of the costophrenic angle. We've demonstrated this with a very x-ray-looking set of sails, with that right costophrenic angle being washed out by that big old wave. If large enough, Impairment of lung expansion may also cause the patient to experience dyspnea. The initial management of chylothorax is to get the fluid out via tube thoracostomy or percutaneous catheter drainage. Sometimes if thoracotomy is performed for surgery, chest tubes are placed intraoperatively and so these may already be in place. Since the lymphatic system transports lipids, a unique feature of the fluid in chylothorax is a high triglyceride level, typically greater than 110 mg per deciliter. It will appear milky in the chest tube canisters because of this. Treatment may also require diet modification to parenteral nutrition with minimal fat. In refractory cases of chylothorax, surgical re-exploration and thoracic duct ligation may be necessary to prevent recurrence. In cases of esophageal cancer where tumor spread is too advanced, palliative therapy consists of endoscopic dilation or stent placement, gastrostomy tube placement, or jejunostomy tube placement. The prognosis for esophageal cancer is poor and depends on the stage at which it's diagnosed. Esophageal cancer spreads quickly through the lymphatic channels in the bloodstream and metastasizes to the bone, liver, lungs, and brain. Symptoms are typically present late in the disease course. Overall, five-year survival of esophageal cancer is 20% with almost no five-year survivors of stage 4 disease. And on that dismal note, let's summarize. Patients with esophageal cancer will typically present with progressive dysphagia, retrosternal chest pain, unintentional weight loss, among other symptoms. EGD should be performed if any alarm or red flag symptoms are present, and biopsy should be taken of any suspicious areas to evaluate for carcinoma. 
Esophageal carcinoma can be either squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is the most common cancer of the esophagus worldwide, typically found in the upper two-thirds of the esophagus, and is associated with smoking, alcohol use, hot liquids, high nitrosamine diet, and betel nut use. SCC typically metastasizes to the lungs. Esophageal adenocarcinoma is the most common esophageal cancer in the United States, is typically found in the lower one-third of the esophagus, and is associated with Barrett's esophagus, smoking, and obesity. It will typically metastasize to the liver and peritoneum. PET CT scans should be used for cancer staging and for identifying nodal or metastatic disease. Endoscopic ultrasound should be used to assess the local extent of tumor invasion. Any evidence of metastatic disease that would not be able to be resected with esophagectomy contraindicates surgical resection. For T2, N0, M0, and below, surgery should be performed first. For T2, N0, M0, and above, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is recommended. T2, N0, M0 may have either neoadjuvant chemotherapy or surgery first. The upper one-third of the esophagus is very difficult to operate on and is not typically performed and patients are treated with chemoradiation alone. There are three different esophagectomy procedures. Transhiatal esophagectomy and triincisional esophagectomy allow for cervical anastomosis. Ivor Lewis esophagectomy has a thoracic anastomosis. Chemotherapy is typically performed for node-positive disease following surgery. Anastomotic leaks are the most feared complication. Cervical anastomotic leaks are more easily treated with local wound drainage, but thoracic anastomotic leaks are much more devastating, with significantly higher mortality, causing soilage of the thorax and mediastinum, progressing to mediastinitis, pleuritis, and sepsis. Treatment may require surgical re-exploration. Another complication is chylothorax, or leakage of chyle from the thoracic duct into the pleural space due to disruption intraoperatively. This presents with distant lung sounds, dullness to percussion over the affected side, dyspnea, and opacification of the diaphragm or costophrenic angle on chest x-ray. Treatment is with chest tube and possible diet modification and parenteral nutrition. Finally, surgical re-exploration for ligation of the thoracic duct may be necessary. And last, a word on palliation. Esophageal stent placement may be considered in patients with advanced esophageal cancer spread. Well, that's a wrap, everyone. Let's pull the curtain on this absurdly out-of-hand vaudeville performance.